Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, to, or tonight uh, in uh, wherever uh, in the world you might be. Uh, thank you for joining us in the Herbal Balan Lecture Series, which is presented uh, by Taipei Cooper and today's presentation by Andreo Balius. Um, uh, Enrique Cruz Vidal, uh, a character in typography, which I'm very excited about and looking very much forward to. My name is Alexander, and I'm one of the instructors on the Taipei Cooper program, which is presenting today's talk. Uh, for those who may not be familiar, Taipei Cooper is a postgraduate certificate program, uh, the core of which is the study of typeface design through its extended and condensed uh, certificate programs. Um, besides typeface design, Taipei Cooper also offers lettering and typography related workshops. And we also organize the annual typographics conference and festival. Uh, look for announcement on that coming out soon. We'll have one uh, uh, in June this year. You can find out more uh, about the program and the public workshops on our website, coopertype.org. I will post a link to that in one second. Um, you could also uh, find out uh, information about our upcoming talks. Uh, we have uh, uh, three more talks in this series, the details of which will be posted soon. Uh, we have two talks in March and one in the first week of April, um, uh, all on Monday nights, um, usually around the same time. So look out uh, for that, so sign up for the mailing list. Um, to get information about that, um, watch our social media um, uh, or check our website. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do is uh, mention that the talk is being recorded. Uh, we are um, um, live streaming through YouTube. So if you wanted to uh, catch this recording, um, you can just click in the top left of your window where you see live on YouTube. You can click on that and you can get the link. You can save that link if you wanted to. Uh, if you have to leave um, before the, the talk is over, I hope you don't. I hope you stick around for all of it. Um, but you can save that link and watch the recording. It will be live uh, right after um, the, the, the lecture ends. Uh, but we will also have uh, an archive um, of this talk. Um, and uh, for that, I wanted to thank uh, Type Culture for the generosity and sponsoring uh, of the recording to make it possible for us to continue adding to a growing digital archive of past talks. So Type Culture is a digital type foundry and, then, and uh, an academic resource for all things related to typeface design. So if you're not familiar with it, you should uh, check them out. They're fantastic. And um, I'll post their link in the chat. Um, so again, um, thank you for Type Culture for uh, allowing us to record this to add to the six plus years of uh, type lectures that we've had uh, uh, and over 80 lectures. So to see them, uh, go to the link I posted and I will post uh, the link um, uh, in uh, the chat uh, once, once we get closer to the start. Um, just very quick housekeeping notes. Um, there is, um, for those who are familiar with, with Zoom, uh, even if you're not familiar, just a reminder, um, there's a toggle in the chat window uh, between everyone and host and panelists. Everyone means everyone watching host and panelists. It's just the us, the team behind. So if you wanted to send a message to the rest of the audience, make sure to toggle uh, the blue little um, button to say everyone. And then we will be taking questions on the, uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, so make sure to send the questions not through chat, but send it through um, the, um, the Q&A function. So we'll be taking questions from that at the end. I'll, I'll, we'll have a short discussion. So make sure uh, to send them this way. Um, so I will introduce today's talk and, our, and, and today's speaker. Um, uh, today's talk, once again, is Enrique Cruz Vidal. Uh, character and typography. Uh, and I think it's a very important talk, especially today um, in type of in, in the time that we're experiencing where there's another world crisis that's obviously in the new cycle. Uh, uh, it's a talk that resonates even more today uh, because of the tolls of wars um, that they take on humanity, uh, but also about the resilience and spirit that is impossible to defeat. Um, Right now, my heart and mind 
or with uh, the people of Ukraine, uh, especially my family and friends who are there. I'm sorry. Um, uh, who are bravely standing up uh, to this needless aggression and incursion into their sovereignty. There's no justification for any of it, uh, despite what the propaganda machine is telling you. Uh, we at the Balance Center, Taipei Cooper, stand with the people of Ukraine and wish them strength as they're being shelled even as we speak. We also stand with everyone who is experiencing conflict across the globe, and we condemn all of those actions in places like Yemen, Syria, Palestine, Afghanistan, and too many to name, unfortunately. Don't forget that conflicts don't end once the new cycles end. The recording of history and retelling of it is really important. History is not only written by the quote unquote victorious. There are other stories. Um, please remember that. Um, and this is one of those stories. With that, um, I would like to um, thank and introduce today's speaker, Andrea Balius, who is a type designer based in Barcelona. He designs both retail and custom typefaces at Type Republic, which is a fantastic foundry. You should buy their fonts, they're, they're, they're awesome. He develops uh, self-initiated projects, uh, uh, type design projects, which many of which involve research and social approach. He holds a PhD in design and is currently teaching typography and type design at ENA, the University School of Design and Art in Barcelona. And he was a, an award-winning typeface designer and has presented lectures, given keynote addresses and workshops internationally. He has been a member of AGE since 2010 and is a member of TDC and ITYPI. With that, I would uh, love to bring on Andrew and thank him for being here uh, from Barcelona and to present this very interesting uh, talk uh, that I hope you all enjoy and watch again afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chas, Sasha, for your for your words and your comments. Yeah, it's really an, a big honor to be here. I want to thank you, everyone that has uh, connected to to be part of this uh, of this talk today. Um, yeah, I will I will share the screen and start. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I'm very excited and at the same time, I'm very pleased to give a talk about Enrique Cruz Vidal. He's quite an unknown Spanish designer and type designer. And I hope that with this talk, I uh, will help to spread some awareness on him. I have to say that I'm not an historian, so I am a type designer. I work as a type designer. But when doing research on type design history, there is one thing that interests me. And this is not only about the historical facts, which can be very amusing and also interesting, but it's more about the ideas, how the ideas, how the ways of thinking influence the work of designers, typographers and type designers, how ideas and ways of looking at the world and, and considering how the world is the way it is, influence ways of thinking and how these ways of thinking, these ideas are, are transferred into the shapes of letters. This is clear in cases such as Futura. As you know, Futura is not only a typeface, it's also a way of thinking. In this lecture, I will try to contextualize the work of Enrique Cruz Vidal. I have divided the, the lecture, <clears throat> sorry, in three parts. The first part, I will cover a brief biography. I will introduce him and talk about his years in Lleida, his birthplace, and the exile in France after the Spanish Civil War. Then I will focus on the work of Cruz Vidal during the, the first uh, years of the of the, the, the 50s and uh, the context within the context of graphi Latin movement in Paris. And at the end, I will analyze uh, his typefaces uh, more closely. Okay, so let's uh, start. 
Crow's Vidal biography is very interesting as a story. I would say that his life is as thrilling as if it was the plot of a movie. I will try to summarize some of the most relevant facts. I hope it's not too long. Crow's Vidal was a man of action with a very strong character. That's one of the reasons of this title, Enrique Crow's Vidal, a character of typo in typography, because he was a very strong man. In his memories, he defines himself as a conservative anarchist, an anti-clerical Christian, and a military pacifist. This is how he wanted to be remembered. He was a man that moved against the current through the waters of history. He was reluctant to accept blindly the trends of his time. This is what I find really interesting in this story. The story of a fight between how to be faithful with your your, your own ideas and at the same time be aware of the mood and the needs of your time. In this case, in the case of Cross Vidal, the fight between the ideas that were behind the graphy Latin movement and the ideas of late modernism. But I don't want to spoil too much, so let's start from the beginning. <clears throat> Cross Vidal was born in Lleida in 1908. Lleida was a small town about 200 kilometers away from Barcelona. Of course, Leida has not moved. It's still, it's still 200 away, kilometers away from Barcelona. But now Leida is an important city. Uh, but of course, at the beginning of the 20th century, when Cross Vidal was born, traveling from Barcelona to Leida was quite an adventure. Leida at the time was, was a town that was shaped by an eminently rural and conservative society. As a kid, Cross Vidal was very naughty. He was a very naughty boy and not very successful in his studies. In fact, he was a very bad student. Such was so that his grandfather, who was a retired military, convinced his parents to force Cross Vidal to enter the military service as a soldier. The family thought that being in the army would be a good way for him to settle down and become a useful man. But Cross Vidal was more interested in art. But at that time, being an artist was not considered a proper duty as a job. Nevertheless, Cross Vidal combined his job as a soldier with his love for the graphic arts. He made some extra money designing advertising posters and leaflets for local businesses in Lleida, his hometown. With his money, he could also self-finance most of his personal projects. Lleida was a town that was distant from the intellectual, political, and cultural events that were taking place in other cities such as Barcelona or Paris, which at that time were important centers in the art scene. In Lleida, we have to take into account that at that time, more than 70% of citizens were illiterate. So you can imagine that the modern and avant-garde ideas were only embraced by very few people. Among a very small group of young artists that embraced those local new ideas was Cross Vidal, and they wanted to improve society by the means of a cultural revolution. So they wanted to change their own their own people, their own place. So their commitment with the arts has to be understood as a way of creative activism within society. <clears throat> Crows took some drawing lessons, but most of his knowledge in art was self-taught learning. He was only 23 when in 1931, he opened his own studio at home. He called it a studio lamp. A studio lamp means in English lining studio, where he worked on commissions and personal projects. Cross Vidal embraced the ideas of avant garde and early modernism. He was attentive to advances, and not only in artistic matters, but also in science and technology.
1933, he founded a cultural magazine called Art. This was a milestone in his career. Art magazine is currently considered as one of the most advanced Spanish magazines at that time. It was an innovative magazine of arts, and this includes poetry, architecture, painting, photography, with high quality standards in terms of content and design. In the magazine, he published works from Garcia Lorca, Paul Eluard, Jean Cocteau, Tristan Zara, of photographs from Man Ray, Herbert Hartmann, Kepler. So all these contents show how was the quality, the big quality of some of the contributions. These are some spread pages of this, of this magazine. The majority of the contents show a very combative attitude against classicism, tradition, and established cultural scene at that moment. Of course, taking sides with modernity. The magazine is a clear manifesto, is a manifesto attitude that reminds us to the avant-garde magazines published in the late 20s and 30s in Europe. It gave voice to the artistic novelties and cultural purposes that came from Barcelona or Paris. Nevertheless, these ideas and revolutionary ways of thinking were totally unacceptable in such a conservative and traditional town as was Lleida, his, his birthplace at that time. So the magazine had a short life due to the low support it had. Economically, it was not a success and only 10 members were published. We could say that Crows Vidal and his friends were misunderstood in the context of a very traditional society. The Spanish, the Spanish Civil War changed the life of all those restless young groups of local artists. As a soldier, upgraded sergeant, Cros Vidal had to defend his own town during the days after the military coup of General Franco. And afterwards, of course, he had to go to the war front. He was mobilized to the, to the front of war. He served bravely in the army during the Spanish Civil War and was rewarded the position of captain. He fought for the legally democratic Spanish Republic. At that time, Spain was a republic with a democratic constitution, and he fought against the troops of the military rebellion. When he was in the army, one of his missions was to preserve the artistic heritage of the Romanesque churches in the Pyrenees, the Romanesque churches that are located in the mountains in northern Spain. At that time, during the, the Civil War, some of the, of the churches, the small churches that were in the, in the mountains, had been looted and burned. And it was important to save the old Romanesque and Gothic paintings and religious work. He participated in some of the operations to safeguard the monuments and artistic works as a delegate of the Catalan government. As you may know, the, the, in the Spanish Civil War, which lasted from three years, from 1936 to 1939, the legal Republican side fought against the fascist side of General Franco who was supported by Mussolini's Italian army and Hitler German army. After the war, as you may suppose, with the victory of the military insurgents, Cros Vidal had to save his life and went into exile in France. But soon, as, soon, soon after the Spanish Civil War, after, after the Spanish Civil War was finished, the Second World War in Europe started. So France was not a very safe place to stay. After the Nazi invasion, the German invasion in, in, of France, Cros Vidal established himself as a war refugee in the French Free Zone, in a village called Montauban. During these days, at the beginning of the 40s, he made his living as a sundial restorer. Also, he decided to enroll in the French resistance. He entered the French resistance around 1942 and helped in the design of fake documents. Since he was 
a good at lettering and good at design, he engaged himself in document forgery. And this is the similar case as the case of uh, a great woman, Elizabeth Friedlander, a Jew type design woman that worked in document forgery also for the British intelligence during the Second World War. In his memories, Crowes Vidal says proudly how these false, these false documents help to cheat the Gestapo officers. But in Montauban, there is a small city in this small town in, in, in southern France, his activities were not reduced to work as a sundial restorer and the French resistance. He made good friends among the intellectuality that were also ex exiled in that place. He got in touch, for example, with the director of the Ingress Museum. And um, yeah, as a short, as a short anecdote, in his memories, Crowes Vidal explains that because of his experience related to the safeguard of documents of, of monuments and artistic works during the Spanish Civil War, he was proposed to be one of the members to save the French national heritage. This mission, this mission was important in order to evacuate and save part of the Louvre collections from the Germans. In his memories, Crowes Vidal explains how he had to move the famous masterpiece La Gioconda by Leonardo da Vinci in the Ingress Museum in Montauban. This story is really amazing. And after the Second World War was over, Crowes Vidal decided to move to Paris and start his life over. He arrived in Paris by the end of 1944. Since he had good experience in the army and because of his degree as captain, he asked for a job in the US army, but since he was not confident with English and he was not accepted, but instead he was offered a job as a letterer. So he got a job as a lettering artist for the US army when in Paris, and this provided some sort of economic stability into his life. In Paris, there will be two persons that push Crows Vidal into his new professional stage. The first one was Pablo Picasso. Thanks to his previous activism and his project art magazine and some acquaintances that uh, Crows Vidal had, he had the chance to meet Picasso. In his memories, he says that this meeting was very important for him because uh, he explains that Picasso already knew the, the magazine, art magazine, and he liked it. Uh, so this, this uh, meeting with Pablo Picasso supposed for Cruz Vidal an emotional push to the new career that uh, he was intending to start in Paris. So he decided to try again as a graphic designer. In this new start as a designer, there was another person who really played an important role in his career. And this man was Maximilian Box. You may have known him about Maximilian Box because of his famous type classification. Well, Maximilian Box was a very influential person in the typography field in Paris at that time. Also, Maximilian Box considered Cros Vidal as the leader of a Latin movement capable of overcoming the influences of the Germanic rational design, which triumphed in the previous years of the war. In 1947, when Cros Vidal was 39 years old, so he was quite old at that time, yeah, uh, Cros Vidal left his job as a letterer in the US Army and started to work as a graphic designer at Dragger one of the most important printing offices in Paris. Since his previous knowledge was mainly self-taught, this contact with the, with the dragger, with this printing, important printing office, gave him much more confidence in his, in his job. He, he, it, was, it was very good for him to improve his skills and knowledge as a designer. After this experience, three years later in 1950, he decided to establish himself on his own as a freelance designer. This is, these are some pieces of work, some advertisements 
he did when he was working for this firm for this for Dragger. The decade of the 50s, the 1950s, was the years of fame for Cross Vidal as a typographer, a designer, and a type designer. During these years, he had different commission works, and in these works, he started to put into practice his ideas on typography and the use of decorative elements in his designs. Also, he started to design his first typefaces and decorative fonts. These are some of samples of work he did between this, the first years of the, the decade of the 50s, last century, where we can see how the decorative elements were applied in the, in the boxes in this case, in the packaging for a clock firm. In these works, we can see applied some of his decorative elements that would later become typefaces. These are two advertisement posters for Perrier and Cinzano. And in the early 50s, he started also collaborating with some important magazines specialized in the printing and graphic arts field, such as Character and Character Noel. For the first number of the magazine Character, he drew one of his best covers in which he designed a lettering that he would develop later as a typeface with the name of Catalans. We will talk about this, about this typeface later. By 1952, he had already become a well-known designer in the profession. This exhibition at the Dorsey Gallery meant the reaffirmation of Cross Vidal as one of the most fashionable designers in Paris. But what happens in Paris at that time? How could we explain the sudden success of Cross Vidal as a designer and type designer? Which were the ideas that inspired the type designing scene after the Second World War in France? Well, before the war, Germany dominated the graphic arts and printing industry in all Central Europe. And after the war, France intended to take this over. There is a need for a change. There is a need, there is a wish also to commit to put the efforts on a renewed typographic and design paradigm, a different model, a model different in front of the dominant German model of rationality. Gross Vidal will be seen as the spearhead of this movement, an aesthetic and ideological movement that would be called Graphite Latin. Graphite Latin was a movement that claimed the value of the letter as the legacy of a culture. There is a move for the humanization of typography, the value of hand, write, of hand drawing and decoration. And although it became visible as a movement during the early 50s, it took ideas that had been previously conceived in the early 30s in France by Maximilian Box and his mentor, Paul Iribe. I have to say that there is not a proper theory that explains precisely what the movement was about, but we can perceive it through the works done by a bunch of designers and type designers such as Cross Vidal. Also, through articles and talks that were transcribed, and altogether, it gives an approximate idea about, about it. In December 1950, Cross Vidal gave a lecture at the STN College in Paris where he tried to explain the core of the Graphi Latin movement and propose or try to propose a theory for this practice. After the lecture, he became like a prophet of this movement that tried to renovate the typography art in France. He exposed in his lecture, which was transcribed and published in Cahiers d'Estien as the richness of Graphi Latin, he exposed that the European typographic scene had been aesthetically dominated by the German ideas. 
typefaces such as Futura and the influence of Bauhaus at that moment were too based on geometry. And any form of decoration was banned or was dismissed in favor of functionality. Cross Vidal was not against Futura, was not against Bauhaus ideas. He was against a conception of a too calculated world where there was no place for decoration. He considered that typefaces such as Futura didn't satisfy the needs of Latin Mediterranean countries, referring to France, but also to Spain and Italy. He considered instead that this sort of design practices, referring to the modernism style aesthetics, were not a reflection on, of the idiosyncrasy of the Latin societies. Instead, he proposed to look for the Roman Latin legacy to be faithful with the Latin heritage and tradition, but at the same time, and this is important, be expressive and come out with innovative new proposals. I want to make it clear that Kroos Vidal was not against the design proposals that appeared in Central, in Central Europe. He only considered that those trends were not fully appropriate in the context of the Latin Mediterranean countries. He was in favor of a more appropriate approach. These are some spreads, some spread pages of this article, the richness of Graphi Latin. And um, this is the, the, the transcribed lecture that he delivered at the Estian College. And he used some photos of his design works and decorative motifs on, of his own. And we can see here the use of parade in the, in the right page and uh, the fook of Darabesque in the, in the left side, two of his first decorative typefaces. Here, Cross Vidal used samples of his work in order to illustrate his ideas. In another article entitled Grace and Harmony of Latin Graphics, he said regarding German design, naturally, the Germanic stroke is of first rate quality. So in this statement, Kroos considers the quality of German design and continues. He says that, but also of a metallic rigidity. So also he criticizes its rigidity and coldness and continues and says that while ours, and he refers here to the Latin stroke, the letter drawings, vibrates with a musical harmony. Okay, in this statement, Kroos considers in a good way the, the quality of German design, although it criticizes its coldness in a way, but what does it mean when he says that the Latin stroke vibrates with a musical harmony? It's difficult to understand a theory that defines itself with these sort of abstract ideas. They are very poetic indeed, but sometimes it's not clear enough. So that's a problem, that's a problem when trying to figure out exactly what they meant with graphi Latin. When they were, yeah, they were using these abstract ideas and using this rhetoric language to explain this movement. But in fact, Kroos Vidal didn't intend to provide a very well-defined profile to this movement. As he warned in his article, he tried to provide some ideas and a starting points that should be interpreted by readers with the help of some photographs of his work. So as we have seen before, Kroos Vidal enclosed samples of his own work in these publications, these, some pictures of the work, because he tried to demonstrate his theory from his practice. For Kroos Vidal and those who were close to these ideas, there was a need to vindicate the Latinity, the Latin values, whatever it means, especially the decorative elements, not only in type design, but also in typography, with the use of decorative motifs in the composition of the page, such as the use of embellishments, ornamental rules, decorative borders, dashes, etc. Sometimes this idea of Latinite, Latinity, the, the Roman legacy, was translated to type design with the design of 
chisel engraved thy faces, incised thy faces, glyphic, lapidary, etc. Another important text where Cros Vidal developed his ideas a bit further is the one he wrote by the end of 1953 and published in, in the beginning of 1954. It's the manifesto Doctrine and Action pour la Renaissance du Graphisme Latin. In this article, Klaus Vidal points out the need for the creation of alphabets that are a reflection of the cultural heritage and Latin sensibility created with the hand and the heart instead of the compass and the calculation from which ge the Germanic typographers start here. Yeah again, criticize this coolness in the, the, the rational design that comes from, from Germany, from the German tradition. Also, he talks about the assessment of typographic decoration, especially through decorative borders, arabesque, and ornaments within the page. Also, the need for development of the plastic and dynamic value of the letter and the ornament. So what we get here is this aesthetic fight between display, decoration, ornament, in front of the idea of what is strictly functional or too based on geometry and mathematics. And also the, this idea of suspicion of anything that comes from Germany. But Latinity was more an attitude related to a cultural vindication that was not exclusive of France. This idea could be also found in the works of other type designers and designers, such as uh, in the case in Spain of Juan Trochut with the super tipo veloz, Aldo Novarese, for example, in Italy. And another of my, my most admired type designers like Roger Escoffon in France. But Grafia Latina, oh, Graphi Latin in French was also a commercial movement. Both foundries, the FTF, Fonderie Typographique Francaise in France and the Fundición Tipográfica Nacional in Spain were committed with the Graphi Latin movement and produced display typefaces that were aesthetically close to those ideas. So they gave commercial support and visibility to the, to the Graphi Latin movement. And of course, at the same time, they made their business out of it. By the early 50s, the design of display typefaces, mainly for the advertising industry, was quite fashionable in France. And the proposals that came from Graphia Latina fit quite well with the commercial needs. During this period, Cross Vidal work on both commission work for important companies in France, such as Air France, and created typefaces taking into account this search, his personal, his personal quest for the Latinité or Latinity. He designed typefaces for Deverny and Peignot, the foundry in France, the FTF, Fonderie Typographique Française, and the Fundición Typographica Nacional, this one in Spain. Cruz Vidal popularity as a type designer decreased as soon as the trends of the Swiss international style imposed its aesthetics. By the end of the 50s, the ideas of functionality became more powerful than those of decorative or decorativism in a moment where the concepts of functionality and rationalism were more worthy. The design and distribution of successful typefaces such as Helvetica, Universe, and Folio by the late 50s changing, changed things drastically. And it was clear that there was a change in aesthetics that broke with the expectations created up to that moment. And this took Cross Vidal by surprise. The success of typefaces such as Universe, published by Deverny and Peignot, forced a shift in the type business. Universe, the famous typeface designed by Adrian Frutiger, was presented in an issue of the magazine Character Noel using references of Roman iconography. So ironically, it seemed that the Latin inspiration was in the hands of a Swiss designer. 
The FTF, the Fondary Typography Francais, that had been engaged with Graphi Latin idea, ideas, changed its business criteria very soon. Since the success of Helvetica by the Haas Foundry in Germany and the successful universe they faced by their competitors at Deverney and Peino in 1960, the Fondry Typographique Francaise started to distribute folio typeface that was a design from Bauer Foundry, a German foundry, under the French commercial name of Caravelle. In this way, the balance moved in the direction of the sans serif text typefaces that would respond better to the modern ideas of thought that would come to prevail in all Europe. So it began to be more evident that the type industry clearly opted for the functional sans serif model. So the logic of the market tipped the balance towards the commercialization of those type novelties, the sans serifs, and the interest of, for those fancy and display typefaces waned. In the 60s, Crows Vidal fades away from the first row of the typographic scene in France. Praised by some and criticized by others, Crows was immersing himself in the territories of oblivion. And due to visual disease problems that did not let him do proper design work, he decided to retire as a professional designer. Nevertheless, he was still active and participated in exhibitions, such as the International Calligraphy Today exhibition that was organized by Hermann Fab and the International Typeface Corporation, the ITC, in 1980. Rose Vidal died in 1987 in Noyon, France. Most of his typefaces became the property of the Neuville Type Foundry based in Barcelona, when the Spanish foundry, this Spanish foundry, acquired the former Fonderie Typographique Française. Some of his typefaces have been digitized by Bauer types, and they are currently available through this foundry. Let's talk a little bit about his typefaces. Most of his typefaces were designed between 1950 and 1954. So in four years, he did most of his work, unless most of the, the well-known work that we, we are talking now. His typefaces respond more to an aesthetic purpose than to rational worries. Although his latest works, as we will see, seem to point more towards a functional direction. Cross Vidal's works respond perfectly to a personal ideology, that of the Graphi Latin movement, and a purposeful movement in the history of typography in Europe. In his quest, in his personal quest for the Latinity of the letter, Cross Vidal had in mind the quality of the Roman letter and the legacy of Latin tradition, a worry that he had to reconcile with the increasing universalization of the sans serif typefaces. Let's talk a bit about some of his type designs. One of, one of his first type designs was an experimental project that uh, we can relate to the avant-garde experiments of the 30s. It was a series of figures in, in it was uh, 154 figures called Parade Typography Ballet, published in the magazine Publi Mondial in 1950. The interesting thing about this series of decorative elements is that they were created from the combination of four models only. Gross Vidal tried to update his idea of modularity, breaking off from geometry and introducing a more organic flavor, as Joan Trochut already did years before with his Super Tipo Veloz. With Parade, Gross Vidal came up with forms that create visual rhythms by means of pure abstraction. In 1951, one year later, the Deverney and Pinot Foundry presented a short series of typographical ornaments as stereotypes designed by Crows Vidal with much more organic characteristics. These works are very closely related to the Fugue of Arabesque, the Fuga de Arabescos, 
the series which had a much wider range of combining elements to work with. The Fugue of Arabesque would be one of Crows Vidal's successes since it was this series of decorative elements that best assembled the aesthetics ideals of its creator, of Crows Vidal, with those of the Grafilatin movement applied to the decoration of the page. When creating this series, Crows Vidal looked for forms that resemble nature. Close proposals brings us closer to the world of decorative type with a new slant. He vindicated the natural movement of the stroke without falling into traditional calligraphic proposals. This collection of decorative elements was produced and distributed by the Fond de Typographique Française in 1951 and also by the Fundición Tipográfica Nacional in Spain in 1951. 54. This is the catalog, the brochure from Tip Fundición Tipográfica Nacional. Crows Vidal first alphabet, the first two were just decorative elements. The first alphabet, Catalans, was presented as a symbol for Mediterranean inspiration. That's what they said. In a special issue, of character Noel in December 1952. Catalans is a typeface with a single font style based on an extremely narrow width and a very small counter design and a characteristic slav serif that emphasizes the reverse contrast of the typeface. The false volumetric perspective effect that is provoked by, by the use of this truncated strange serif gives Catalans a structural tension that makes it particularly original. Catalans was not published commercially, but the typeface was used by Cross Vidal himself in different works, such as imposters, advertising com commissions, etc. Here we can see uh, a drop, uh, Catalanes uh, used as drop cap in this, uh, in this spread page of the character Noel in 1952. Without any doubt, the typeface that had the greatest acceptance in the professional world for its practical use, of course, was Paris typeface. It was, it was more intended for text typefaces. Paris is an unconventional family. It, it's a family that uh, has only one uppercase characters with lining figures. And uh, the light version, the Magre light version, and the demi grass, semi bold styles are quite narrow, while Paris grass, the bold style, is much more thick and wide, and it responds to different proportions. We can see here how the, the light or the Magre and the semi demi grass are more narrow and the, the, the bow one, it's wider. So different proportions at the end. Uh, this typeface was also distributed in both in, in by the Fondry Typographique Française in France, but also it was distributed in Spain by the Fundición Tipográfica Nacional. These are some pages of, of the brochure of this, uh, the type of specimen of Paris typeface. It was more legible than Catalans, for example, but again, it's not really a text of typeface. It's more intended for, for display for titles. These are the pages that uh, were printed in the type of specimen in, uh, in Spain for Fundición Tipográfica Nacional. Flash is a display typeface designed to be a nice complement for this family. In fact, Flash is a variant of the Paris ball style that intends to give a 3D effect to the letter through this combination of light and shadow created inside the strokes that define the letter. 
So it's the same, the same weight, the same design, but with this, uh, this 3D effect. If you look at the, of the metal type, this is the picture. In this picture, we can see the detail of, of the engraving of this, uh, this effect which I think it's very interesting. It gives a lot of light in the, in the typeface when it's, it's used. So Cross Vidal collaborated with the FTF in France. And at the same time, he designed the typefaces for Fundición Tipográfica Nacional in Spain, as it was the case for this typeface called Ilerda. The name Ilerda comes after the name that the Romans gave to Lleida the birthplace of Cros Vidal. I understand this typeface is like an homage that Cros Vidal made to his, his birth, uh, birth, birthplace. It's a typeface with only one weight based on a linear modular structure. It's a very compressed sans serif that reminds us to the Art Deco typefaces uh, that still were used in Spain and continued to be in fashion in Spain during the 40s and the 50s. As said, Ilerda was produced and distributed by the Spanish type foundry, Fundición Tipográfica Nacional in 1954, but it was also distributed in France some years later with uh, small variations and uh, it was commercialized under the French name of Champs Elysees. As you can see, this was these years from 1950 to 1954. These four years were very prolific, was a very prolific uh, period of time for Cross Vidal in terms of type design and all the work he did. But Cross Vidal was criticized for being too decorative and they told his typefaces were not, on, were not very useful for text composition. The importance, the importance of legibility in type design and the use of more functional typefaces other than display ones made Cross Vidal change his mind and explored a compromised solution that would reinforce the balance between functionality and expression. So from the mid fifties, we can observe a shift in his designs towards a more text direction, or let's say a more utilitarian or functional direction. Ile de France, also uh, named France, uh, was the result of a different approach. It was produced in 1959, so, mm, there is a gap between 1954 to 1959, and it was produced by Fondery Typographique Francaise. It's a chiseled family with three weights. Uh, it has no italics, but it has lowercase. In this case, it was thought more for running text. And it has features that make it resemble a little bit uh, like Paris typeface. Let's compare it, and we see there is something there are some similarities. Looks like there is like a surge in, in the concept of designing a typeface in the, in the mind of Cros Vidal that we can see an evolution that goes from Paris to Ile de France and then to the last typeface structure, which we will discuss later. So as opposed to other families that we have seen, that happened to be quite condensed no, the other families like Ilerda or Paris are quite condensed. And uh, this case, uh, it's more generously white and it has more open counters. Proportions look better in terms of uh, legibility. So with Ile de France or France, Crows tried to go further in, the, in his search for a perfect symbiosis between Latin tradition and European modernity represented by the simplicity of the sans serif. Nevertheless, he kept a moderate contrast that is close to the Roman capital letter designs. The general aspect of this family responded to a moment of changing tendencies when typefaces such as Universe or Optima started to become popular. 
Structura was one of Crows Vidal's latest typeface creations. It was designed in 1966. So a long time ago from, the, from these prolific years of the early 50s. A structura, as its names suggest, it's a formal depuration of Crows Vidal's typographic ideal. He avoided contrast and designed a much more regular sans serif typeface, although it maintains the flavor of the Roman capital letter. In any case, in this case, he opted for legibility when he designed this new typeface. He intended to evolve an alphabet based on rigor and purity of form. It's clear that Cross Vidal wanted to achieve with his latest alphabets, with this one and the last one, Ile de France, a humanistic sans serif model that best represented in his view the spirit and measure elegance characteristic of the Roman capital letter. I believe that Crows Vidal tried to reconcile with himself, trying to design a text typeface that would much make his own ideas on Latinity aesthetics and the trends of those years when the fashion of the international Swiss style was successful all over the Western world. Crows Vidal's contribution to Western typography should be considered or should be understood in the setting of friends emergence from the Second World War, a period in which the country was striving to rediscover its cultural identity and revive its economy. I, I, I've tried to explain briefly how a movement, a movement such as Graffi Latin reflected the way of thinking and the application of its ideas to the craft of typography and type design. Cross Vidal was a reflective practitioner and an activist. Thinking and doing were the same thing for him. In his search, in his personal quest for the Latin character of whatever his concept of Latinity was, he had to reconcile his personal aim with what was inevitable the dominance of sans serif typefaces and Western European rational thinking. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'll do my best to provide a proper answer. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. This is just uh, astounding to see all these images and see such a a deeper uh, perspective on 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 Enrique's work. Um, uh, what a fascinating, fascinating uh, history. Uh, so thank you for like a, a exposing this this audience we have with us to to his work and also the the work uh, of the Graffi Latina movement, which I think is, is is super super interesting for folks to know. Is like a bit of a counterpoint, as you said in your talk, to kind of the more Central European. Um, uh, idea so um, very 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 interesting um, there's tons and tons of uh, uh, thank yous in the chat for you so uh, I'll just in spirit sort of passing them on to what a fantastic talk um, uh, there's been some some questions in in the chat that I will uh, be glad to take uh, in in the Q and A and uh, for those um, wondering about the links I um, I tried to collect them there's definitely uh, Zoom is not super friendly with with links, and if you're trying to pay attention and not click on links, you might get lost in the shuffle. I put together a, a very quick um, web page with the links that were shared in the chat. As we start the Q and A, I will post that to the chat. So if, if folks wanted to just just click on that, and then at least like all the links will be in one place. So I'll uh, I'll do that in a second. Uh, let me go through the question. I I had one question um, that I wanted to maybe like uh, start things off um in 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 um i think sort of more general um was you know talking about the um the graphi latine or uh, movement or graphi latina movement and there's a, there's a question actually in in, in the q and a about um you know this this idea of uh latin you know and 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 we we touched on this like previously just in terms of the 
the terminology itself, you know, and, and, you know, it's like in the North South America context, Latin means something specific um, in, yep. in sort of a European context, it means something else. Can you talk a little bit about like what the, the people like Maximilian Vox and, and, and Rick were, were sort of thinking about in, in that sense, and maybe like a, a sense of nationality, although it's international, but still sort of within a, a certain region. Yeah. Yeah, I'm aware that uh, talking about this concept of Latin, it has a different meaning in in the States or in, in America than in um, in Europe. When we talk about Latin, the Latin movement, we refer to the um, to the legacy, the tradition that comes from the Romans. So the Roman Empire and the Latin culture. So that means the Mediterranean culture that implies France, Spain, Greece, Italy, the north of Africa. So all this, all this uh, cultural area that uh, during a certain period of time um, have been um, uh, very close together in terms of, of the script, in terms of the Latin script, the language. So, so when we talk, uh, and when Maximilian Box was uh, vindicating this spirit of Mediterranean or this spirit of Latinity, and also Cross Vidal, uh, they were trying to, to, to vindicate the tradition of the, the lettering, the, the stroke of the pen of the Latin, the, the, the lapidary classic Roman letter. So it's, it's about this. So it's um, more about going back to tradition. But in the case of Cross Vidal, he didn't want to stand only in the tradition. The, he, he says that, the, the, OK, it's, we have to, to look for our roots to our own tradition. So we have to go to the Mediterranean cultures. We have to look to Greece. We have to look to to Rome, to the Greeks, to the Romans, and try to find out something new. And that was the, the, the goal for them. But uh, they, they, they didn't want to, um, to dismiss the use of decoration. So because they thought that decoration is the arabesque, what they call the arabesque, and they confronted the arabesque with the cube. They, they thought that the cube is North Europe. It's something that it's cold, it's uh, metallic, it's rigid. So they wanted to vindicate this, uh, this legacy of the tradition and the decoration. Also, if you go to North Africa, you go to Morocco, there is a lot of ornament, there is a lot of decoration, and this is richness. So this is something that is also um, together in this uh, Mediterranean culture. So they were vindicating this. Mm -hmm. So it's a concept of Latinity that is totally different as what we uh, sometimes when we talk about Latin music and we know that we are referring to a specific uh, part of, uh, of America in South America. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's also like very interesting to think about it in the context of like labels and the sort of the, the, the tricky problematic nature of like putting a very precise label on something, uh, especially when it comes to people and, 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 cultures and histories it's like you know it becomes like a label becomes very homogenous and, and sort of maybe too rigid but what's what you know the the ancient roman sort of world obviously like spanned uh, uh north of africa and certainly and and if you look at the history of of uh you know many places in spain especially in the south of spain like how the moorish influence the arabic influence in in, in the architecture and, and 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 sort of visual culture of that so in a way, like Latin kind of incorporates not just like the Roman, but also like the, the, the Muslim exactly. world, like the aesthetic. So it's a much more nuanced uh, thing, which, again, I think as a, as a counterpoint to sort of the modernist movement happening uh, a little bit to the north is super interesting to understand. And especially like in the context of um, how, you know, historically, that is the more dominant form you know, in the, in the history of design and typography, the, the Northern European uh, has sort of been written sort of more squarely into the, the history. And so we often kind of overlook these, these other things. And I think it's, you know, obviously important to rebalance those, those, those things. Um, I'm just going to take a couple more questions um, in here. Um, there's, there's a question earlier um, in uh, by Martin, Martin Flores, our, one of our students, 
um, asking about the the forgery process, the document forgery process, like you know something about the uh, early early you know you know war wartime uh, stuff. Do you, is there more um, information about that? Um, like uh, sort of what that involved? The forgery, the forgery document. You mean? Yeah, yeah I don't know exactly the sort of documents, but I, I assume that there are passports and they are permissions, permits. So at the, at the time that there was the French resistance, they, they were trying to, um, yeah, there was a zone in, in France that was free and they, they were trying to, yeah, to, to help the allies to enter and pass from one zone to the other. So they need permits. So there was some sort of uh, work that um, that they did. It was not the only one because I I, I also told that uh, in in Britain in 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 the in uh, in the UK the, uh, the, the 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 type designer Elizabeth Finlander worked also in document forgery for the British uh, intelligence. So it was something that uh, was quite common in in designers that had to exile and had to make their living and also helping. So uh, we have to take into account that um, Cros Vidal was fighting against the fascists. So when he was in France, he also, he couldn't take the, the arms, but uh, for him, he could, he, he, he helped us as he could doing this sort of work. But uh, I, I don't know exactly which sort of documents uh, he did, but I assume it was uh, per from permits, identity cards, and all these all these sort of, of mm -hmm. fake documents that uh, to cheat uh, the, the officers of the, the Nazis, the German officers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, putting putting the skills to use. Uh, I mean, always like in, in, in difficult situations, finding ways to. Um to do this there's a question i, I don't want to miss it in the, in the chat it's not in the q a but it's a question from my colleague here Caprini and stephanie jean jean who asked if there are any celtic references in the graphy latina or is it uh, specifically kind of more like do you know of any celtic or celtic kind of uh influences within that sorry the like celtic or celtic influences to graphy celtic, latina no no, no they, they try to look for the lapidary Roman letters mainly, and also the display typefaces. We can have a look at the, the works from Mexico 4, for example. Mexico 4 experimented a lot. So we, there is a typeface that is called Calypso, that's great. And it has also some sort of um, similarities with, uh, with Flash in terms of they were looking for a 3D effect. So it was an interesting approach as a type design in that time. So there is a lot of experimentation in lettering and trying to make uh, from draw the, the hand drawing letters um, and and display typefaces. But I haven't I haven't seen any sample of uh, Celtic or I haven't read anything about the influence of uh, of northern cultures in in this mm -hmm. in this field this movement of graphia Latin. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question I, I saw in the Q and A that um, about, um, and, and I'll, I'll read the question from from Till. I, I hope I pronounced them, uh, the name correctly. Um, mention you mentioned Excofon, et cetera, as part of this movement. Would you consider Mendoza as part of this movement? Did they all consciously consider themselves as part of the movement, working on the same shared objective? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah the, the talk was focused on Cros Vidal. Uh, we could talk a lot about Maximilian Box. We could talk a lot about uh, Jose Mendoza y Almeida and um, and the type the typeface Pascal, for example. That Pascal is a typeface that has this tradition. It's an in 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 size uh, typeface. Very looks a little bit like Optima, but it uh, has its own personality. But um, yeah. This, these people, these, uh, these type designers were, were close to these ideas. Mm -hmm. And, and Escofon's, um, I believe like his first yeah. type is Chambord also kind of is similar in, in, in that it's like an Optima, it's like a sans serif with, with, with a bit of contrast to it, but it, it, the roots are probably much more like incised uh, uh, shapes of, of kind of Latin uh, yeah. characters. Um, also in, in post design, for example, you will have Savignac, 
who was also an apostle designer in French, was, was also close to this idea. So it was not only about type design, it was more um, a, a, a graphic graphic movement. Mm -hmm. And they had, in, in, and, and, you know, in, as a movement, I mean, like, I think it was, it was certainly sort of like a, a group of people that Madan regularly spoke. I mean, they had, um, um, you know, um, I think it was an annual, I believe it's an annual meeting where in Lure, right, in France, they would, they would get together um, and, and talk about ideas, share ideas about typography and, and the, in this beautiful countryside, uh, uh, you know, kind of taking in the sort of Mediterranean uh, spirit and like th discussing these ideas. Uh, so it was, I think, a very serious um, group of, of like-minded individuals who came together and, and, and uh, you know, were incredibly significant in, in their time and interesting how um, are lesser known today, unfortunately, with, you know. Uh, yeah, most of these ideas are published in, or can be seen in terms of uh, the, the mise en page, so the, the, how in articles, pictures, and, and in the Character Noel. Character Noel, which is a publication, a magazine, a big one, it was an annual, a printing manual, um, uh, with a lot with text and picture photographs and there you can you can figure out about all this movement mm -hmm. because it was like the, this bible or, or let's say it's the, the the place where they publish their thoughts when they were discussing in Lourdes in the rencontres de Lourdes um, yeah yeah for if folks are interested in seeing um uh seek out issues of character noel uh they're they're not hard to find i mean like certainly in images online uh, you get an idea but they're also um were well distributed maximilian vox had, had a very significant uh reputation and and uh, uh was well respected so his his reach was was quite global uh you know to to some degree certainly american typographers knew um, Maximilian and, and correspondence. So there are artifacts uh, in in major kind of uh, libraries here in, in the states and university libraries. So if you wanted to see um, the uh, that material, um, you you can find it. Um, and there's there's kind of an interesting question from Blake Blake Rosenberg um, and Walton Shu. Um, kind of similar questions. I mean, Blake's um, common question is, I feel like I recognize one of his typefaces from Truffaut film, Shoot the Piano Player. I'm curious about whether his influence had an impact on the European cinema culture of the 60s. And then Walton's question about, you know, what context uh, was uh, um, uh, Enrique's um, uh, type design was meant to be seen in books or posters. Obviously, you touched on that in terms of more display, kind of more, more of that purpose. But do you think that there was an influence on the 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 style of film posters in in that period that that kind of took some cues from from them? Mm, not sure. I don't know because uh, I'm thinking about the Nouvelle Vague in France, the the, the cinema, and it's after it's. It's more in the 60s, so, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe there, there is a connection because um, the, um, the Graffi Latin, maybe it's not about Graffi Latin, it's more about uh, when they were trying to, to find out a French identity in a way, and there was a, like a, a, a cultural movement that was beyond printing arts and typography and design, and, and it was more about cult, cult, culture in general. But I don't know, I cannot, uh, I don't know if there is a, a connection, mm -hmm. could be. Mm -hmm. And you, would you say like the, by the 60s, the, the movement has, I guess, lost traction, lost steam by, mm -hmm. by, by the 60s, it was sort of more, yeah. the, the, the Europe kind of moved on, embraced more of the modernist. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. it was it was more active during the fifties. In the sixties, the mid sixties, uh, there were another sort of interest and and yeah. Mm -hmm. And you 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 mentioned this in your talk, um, the relationship between the uh, FTF, right, the Fondue Typography Française, and and the Catalan. So there was kind of an expat community, right, because of the, the tension uh, or the effects of the civil war in Spain and, and the 
pro close proximity of, of Spain to Cat Catalonia, uh, to of, of France rather to Catalonia, kind of creating that that hub. So after um, the war, there was, I guess you know, like a, a significant movement and support, right, for for artists back and forth. And and do you think that um, FTF and and uh, at the time was able to support the the Catalan? Uh, design or, or the the you know financially at least a little bit because i know there's certain typefaces that were released in ftf which were also released in spain but also um like uh uh Truchutz, uh jean, jean Truchutz, uh type was was marketed and, and sold right bizont uh or maybe not bizont um uh, uh, muriel muriel was juventud and um yeah was that was that sort of um financially was that were, were were those opportunities able to 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 kind of flow back into Catalonia and and support the the design there was it was it mutual you know like was it sort of more from like France being a little bit more um by that point financially stable or no I think it was just a commercial relationship and there was a very close like partnership because the um, in the case of Cross Vidal and also the case of Juan Trochut, most of their designs were both published in both places. Mm -hmm. so, um, I think that uh, because of the autarky, so when the General Franco was dictating, was ruling Spain, uh, it was very expensive to import goods from, from other countries. So maybe in that time, it was easier to produce the, type, the designs in, in place instead of um, importing. So maybe that they had some sort of partnership or business collaboration, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I haven't studied this, this, this part. But yeah, but uh, it's not so that there is a, a relationship, a very very close relationship between both foundries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It mutually sort of be beneficial, right? Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Also with, uh, with Iranzo Foundry, Jose Iranzo Foundry in Barcelona, that, uh, that was the one that produced the Super Tipo Veloz. And, and the FTF also did the same in, in France. They mm -hmm. distribute the, the Juan Trochut design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have we have um, like a, a small pamphlet of uh, I think it's from from Aranzo for um, Super Tipo Veloz uh, in the collection. We have the four Novatum albums, uh, and and in one mm -hmm. of them there's a sort of an insert, and um, I know that the same sort of uh, pamphlet was issued by FTF. So it was just just in French translated, but like basically the same idea, the same sort of marketing kind of like. Yeah. For, FTF and Aranzo at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> I think we have maybe time for two questions. There's there's two in in um, in the Q and A. They'll combine. There's sort of like a, a follow up from Till. Um, sorry, my lights go out. Um, um, about sort of the 3D approach, um, which which you know uh, was visible. So um, I'll read the question. Do you think the 3D approach in Flash and Calypso uh, came mainly from aiming for Latin dynamism, expressivity, and the new approach to the arabesque? Um, and then the follow up. Um, um, I mean, more than the new phototype techniques, optics, were there quite mm -hmm. some 3D typefaces coming out at the same time? Yeah, the technology at that time plays an important role. So I haven't mentioned it, but at that time we have the, the Lumi type and we have the uh, phototype setting that was developing in France. So in the Latin, the, the, um, the Graphi Latin movement, uh, we're, we're aware about all these uh, new technologies happening. And they were thinking also in, in terms of three-dimensionality and try to adapt the type designs to the new technology. Even though the new technology was at the, at the first steps of its, um, of its um, evolution. So, and, and yeah, and, uh, and I, I have read, there are some texts of Cross Vidal that uh, he, um, he tries to, to push 
towards the, a new stage of type design that mm, has to be three-dimensional. So there is, there is some, uh, some texts that are, um, are going in this approach. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also interesting that like a predominantly two-dimensional medium like photography could could push people into sort of three-dimensional space in in maybe it's a it's a it's both like a technological shift and and make things easier but also pushes people to think about dimension in, in a different way because you know a typeface like calypso is kind of a byproduct of half toning which is a very photographic step but then it's very dimensional so it's just like 3d 2d 2d 3d which i think is is quite fascinating to think about you know even like you know as, as an embracement of something but also um being pushed by it not necessarily rejecting but saying you know now that there's this dimensionality like what what do we think about that that's, that's super interesting um and there's a question from kelsey maybe this is the the question we can close on but um Kind of just a just a, a clarification question about the, something you mentioned earlier. You, you mentioned that there was a, um, a, um, a Jewish woman who also forged documents, uh, and you, I think you said this earlier in, in your talk about with Chris Vidal. Um, do, do you know the name? The person that Kelsey was asking if you know the name of that person and a little bit more. Uh, was there a direct interaction between between Enrique and her, or was, were there just a parallel story of forging? No, it's a parallel story. I, I mentioned Elizabeth Friedlander, which was a Jew woman that uh, I think it's, we could say it's the first typographer woman uh, that was, um, he was working for the Bauer Foundry, but uh, during the, the Nazis, she had to, to escape. And uh, it's also a, a story uh, as a life. It's a... Uh, it's a really a very interesting story. And he worked for Monotype later and he was working um, uh, in, um, for Penguin Books. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting story. There is a typeface that is called Elizabeth that uh, ha had been released by the Bauer Foundry and now has been digitized. I, I was in the process of, digi of the digitization of this typeface for Neuville Digital in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. just, just Elizabeth Freelander, it's a, a very interesting uh, character also. Mm -hmm. I posted the link to, to that typeface and then someone typed out the name. So if you if folks- Oh, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Her work, please perfect. check her out. Uh, uh, the the work is is fantastic. There's there's a few articles floating around, so if folks are interested. Um, mm -hmm. There's there's some um, uh, historical research on um, Alphabet's um, website about about her her yeah. work. Yeah, that's very nice. Yeah, I think it's a, a woman, a type design woman that should be vindicated because that's not many people know about about her work, and mm -hmm. she was a pioneer in in the type design field. Yeah. Yeah, um, definitely sort of reinforces why history um, and research is important and, and how important it is to sort of give voice to um, to that history and, and, and really sort of even uh, the conversation from sort of these more dominant forms. So I, I, I hope that folks watching enjoyed this talk. I certainly did. I learned a lot um, and made me even more curious to find out more and more. Uh, and we hope to have you um, back with us for, for another, another talk, uh, Andrew. Uh, it was, it was, it's a pleasure uh, to bring your knowledge and, and your insight and your research to our audience, and we hope for more. Um, so thank you for, for sharing it's, this with us. It's a pleasure. It has been a pleasure for me, and also it has been a great honor to be part of this program. Thank you so much for the invitation. And thank you all the listeners, all the participants in this uh, in this Zoom session, uh, I'm very grateful for your attention and yeah, hope you have a nice day. Yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you everyone, we'll see you all soon. Uh, keep an eye on our future lectures, but have a great day, stay safe uh, and uh, no war. <laughs> yeah, please, please. <laughs>